All right, construction champions. It's Ron Nussbaum, your host for another great episode of Construction Champions, where we're opening the doors and having the conversations that you want to hear to have the growth that develops you into the construction champion that you are. Every day of the week, we are doing amazing things. And if you haven't noticed, we're now on twice a week. Every Monday, every Thursday, you can tune in and continue down your championship road. Today, I have an excellent guest, one that's going to blow your mind with knowledge around the construction champ, around the construction industry. Laura, it's great to have you here today. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Why don't you tell all the construction champions out there listening a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I'm kind of an oddity in construction, I think. I did not go to school to be in construction. I am an industrial engineer. And honestly, I tripped and fell into construction. It was completely accidental. And I just um, couldn't leave. There was still things to accomplish within construction. And I spent a lot of time in construction sites and in the field in multiple um market sectors and in multiple locations too. So that was, I learned a lot from just geographical difference differences between construction teams. But then <clears throat> I found myself in the corporate universe and became, I guess to be succinct, succinct that's one of my uh, goals is to be more succinct in life. I really became like a leadership expert and I do, do a, a ton of partnering sessions and facilitations and teaching and processes and just everything from the corporate universe to the actual business of construction on the job site where you're 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 wearing your boots and they're getting good and dirty. That's awesome. So a, a wide range of knowledge here and in a different perspective than we probably typically get being that you kind of fell into it. So I'm super excited about today's interview. Me too. <laughs> let's see so, what kind right, of trouble we can cause. What was that again? I said, let's see what kind of trouble we can cause. Be some yeah, disruptors let's see, here. Let's see where the conversation takes us here today. So yeah. million dollar question. What does it take to be a construction champion? What does it take to be a construction champion? So I've thought a lot about this and I, I actually looked up the words, the two words, construction and champion, because, you know, words mean different things to different people. And that's a key part of communication is making sure that the words you use mean the same thing to everyone that's sending a message and receiving a message. So I actually did look it up and champion. I thought, uh, what a great word and a confusing word. And I think it it's important for this conversation that the, the dichotomy between the, the definitions of this word. So champion, right? You think of champion, you think I am the champion. I conquered the world. I won. I beat out all others, right? I, I, I rose above. And so that's what we think of when we think of champion. But it has a completely different meaning as well, where it's someone who facilitates that success of other people. And, and without, um, like thinking of their own success because I'm championing, championing you. And, um, but it, it, it gets super interesting when you kind of put these two things together, because to be an effective champion, you have to use your expertise, your experience, your knowledge, skills, and ability to help support and raise others up to help them achieve more, to be a champion for someone else. And so I, I think that this is a really great word to do a lot of like deep thinking on like the differences and how they, the definitions support and, and conflict with each other. It's not a small thing really. Um, and so it, I think what it takes to be a construction champion is to A, have that expertise in the field of construction, recognizing that the entire industry is a very rich tapestry of people and skill sets and drivers and motivators. I mean, we've got architects, engineers, designers, owners, like it goes on and on and on, Never mind the, the construction managers and the general contractors and the trade specialties and the inspectors. I mean, the list is just humongous. humongous. So 
being able to take that construction expertise and then being an advocate and a supporter of the industry at large and the individuals that make up the industry and the teams that need to collaborate. That's what it takes. It takes understanding the interworkings and the system of construction and what it takes for the individuals and teams to succeed and achieve more. That's my definition of what it means to be a construction champion. <laughs> That's awesome. I love, so when I, I look at the word champion and I'm, I'm a big component of just being a champion and not just from the winning perspective of the sports side of things that we see, but also what you talk about where you champion something, you're, you're the one behind that. And I want to dive into that because that is the side that we typically don't talk about. So when when you talk about champion for the construction industry, like you're you're the one behind it, driving that change, driving that momentum. What what do you see happening out there right now where people are being champions? There's when someone's a champion, they understand the um the difficulties, you know, the challenges, and they're able to help others persevere through those and contextualize what what needs, what the book says needs to be done with the practical experience and and help it make it meaning help make it meaningful to the person that or company or team or whatever that they're championing. So it, mm. it's really driving context to make what we know in our heads meaningful to the actual situation that we're in it's bridging that gap and uh, i think that that's that's really what it looks like it's that's kind of ambiguous but con success in construction is ambiguous too every site is different every team is different every requirement is different the weather is different every everything is different and we achieve more when we're able to use acumen, which I define acumen as the ability to respond to change. So a champion helps facilitate others to respond to change because of their expertise, knowledge, skills, and abilities. Yeah, absolutely. And being that you're you're a leadership expert here in the construction industry, I do, I do, I have I have a question about that. And it kind of stems from what we were just talking about is we find all too often in construction, like it, it's hard when that, that new leadership comes up or you, you're working your way through those ranks. How, how do you become that champion to be able to help that leadership move up through the organization? What, what are some of the keys that you're seeing that people are utilizing that are making that an easier process to develop leaders within our industry, not trying to just bring leaders in from outside? So to me, it begins with day one and even at day negative 10, when you're bringing in interns or you're doing outreach to high schools and you're supporting overall you know, STEM academics and, and helping people experience going, getting people interested in construction and engaged and excited about building things. And building, it doesn't have to be actually putting the bricks and sticks together. It could be building the ideas or the design sparking that that interest is where it really begins, I, I think. And I, I, I get on a little bit of a soapbox on the topic of when should leadership development start? And it really chaps my hide when um, I hear, well, managers of XYZ level and above, we're going to give them leadership training. And, and my skin just crawls because we need to be looking at the long-term sustainability of our industry and the people within our industry. And um, in my opinion, we need to be developing leadership skills. And really, if we call them people skills from day one, because that's what they really are, there are management skills and there are people skills. If we're developing that, we have a mindset that that is what is going to build my pipeline of successors in a successful organization that is going to get us to excellence because we've got to be able to share institutional knowledge. That means lessons learned. That means what worked, what didn't work. You know, does this policy still make sense? And um, does it not? And what can we get rid of? How can we be more lean and mean and all of that stuff? It begins day one. And, um, and that's how we do it. 
we, we, we can't be, we, we need to stop looking at title as uh, uh, the key to getting through the people skills and leadership development door. I, I think we shoot ourselves in the foot all the time when we do that every single time. When I'm teaching leadership for the first time to foremen and superintendents who are out there leading every single day, where the money gets made, where the money gets lost, where people get hurt or are safe, I get really irritated. Like this is your first leadership class. This is your first oh. communication class. How is that possible? They're the most important parts of our industry. And we spend the least amount of time helping them build, help, giving them tools so that they can build those people skills as well as the building. I could go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, they're the ones out running the job sites. They're the ones yeah. out quality assurance, making sure things are happening. So what's an effective way from day one to be able to start implementing leadership change? Or, or as you had said, minus day 10, what what are some steps that we can do to start to, to be better at this? Well, well, I think that the you there's language is important. And if we're not exposing people to a plethora of ideas, they're not there. You know, that, that saying, you don't know what you don't know. Hmm. We, that's where we need to start. We need to be giving opportunity, creating opportunity for getting exposed to multiple situations, multiple tasks, multiple projects, multiple challenges and, and multiple ways of thinking so that people can start to build a base of experience and a base of language so that they can become, they can explore more, be curious and actually dive deeper and look at what um, excites them and they want to become experts in. And I mean, just something simple like, like communication. Here's a word that everybody thinks they know. And yet it is still, there was a, a I think in, 1991, maybe even earlier than that, Iowa State University did a study, three major causes of failures on construction. Number one cause was lack of communication. The second one was scheduling. And then the third one was planning. And over and over and over again, you keep hearing people touting that, yeah, communication is the number one problem on construction. So, yeah, no, duh. It's been published for decades through empirical study, and yet we're still really bad at it. And I think that... Um, one of the reasons that we're really bad at it is that we forget that communication is a two-way street. It's not enough to send out a message. That's transmitting information. Communication, the loop is complete when you have confirmed understanding of that message. And so starting there and helping people understand how do you confirm that your message was received so that that person can take action on it. That that would be the the foundation that I would that I would say to start with with individual contributors all, all the way up through that would be the skill and and then followed very closely by communication styles and personality styles because if I approach you and I say hey Ron here's a boatload of data let's talk about it you're gonna be like huh but if I say hey Ron how are the kids this weekend? And you say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, now let's talk about the information. Like there's two different personality styles going on there. One doesn't want to be bothered with the, the personal question. And the other one is going to be offended if you don't ask it first. So those two things like go together. A, understand what communication actually is. And then B, you're communicating with people. So get a better understanding of people. Get some language that you can use to your benefit to leverage what you know or don't know about people and communication styles. Yeah, I think I think you just unpacked a lot of what is just some of the issues because we are we're taught not not just from a young age, but just in the industry like that communication is if I tell you something, that's the communication. There, right. there, it doesn't exactly. have to become this closed circuit, but that is what has to end up happening in order for successful communication to happen. And it's really, it's really hard to, the later on you wait, the harder it is to train on that and become better. And I, I like the, the idea of having an understanding of that from day one, where this is how we communicate here. Like 
we close the loops. It's not just a one-way street of communication. That's just the start of it. Yeah, yeah. And it's a, it's kind of similar to saying like, well, I just had a conversation with so-and-so. Oh, you did? Well, what did they say? And then you think, well, wait, they didn't say much. Well, why? Because you weren't having a conversation. You were having a monologue, right? So the difference between a monologue and a dialogue, <laughs> it's like, it lives there. Yeah. And then understanding those personality types. I mean, that's, I think, so key. And, and not only the ones around you, but understanding yourself and what personality yeah. you are, I think, is a, a great attribute that we should spend more time on helping our people understand. Like, this is yeah. you. This is how you communicate. This is how what drives you. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I am. Um a great advocate of, um, and I do a lot of teaching and a lot of seminars on communication styles because it it's the foundation for it. And I think that really sometimes we get a little too academic about our thinking, like um, I, I can't get the phrase emotional intelligence out of my head when we talk about this, because emotional intelligence kind of seems a little fluffy, and but really it's being able to assess the communication styles of what's going on and how people are reacting and behaving and the emotional drivers of that and then be able to respond to it right in a, in a way that kind of moves things along and so that's kind of where the rubber meets the road with emotional intelligence but without understanding communication styles and to your point you, your own but i think it's important to understand your own so that you can better assess how the people you're interacting with are, are responding so that you can nudge what needs to happen so you can keep those channels open and, and people's minds open. You know, I often say that um, we have many meetings. I know you've been in a trillion meetings like I have, you know, one of the rules of conduct is always like keep an open mind. Well, okay, that's nice to say, but what does that mean? And so I always say, well, the first thing that you can tell that your mind is closing is when you start to get defensive. The moment you start to feel your hackles rise and you're getting defensive, that's a cue, an internal trigger that your mind is now closed. Now you're not listening and absorbing anymore. You're 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 preparing what you're going to say, right? Your rebuttal. So when you start to really dive into communication and personality styles, if you're able to say, "Oh wait, this kind of these kinds of words or this kind of style kind of put me on the defensive," if I can move that trigger out of my way, then I can keep my mind open longer, which means I'm listening longer, which means I'm processing longer, which means I'm better able to ask open-ended exploration style questions rather than just like, but, but, but done, mm. do it, don't care, get, get through it. So th there's a, there is a lot there. There's a lot <laughs> to that onion. <laughs> well, I think what you just said is really, really powerful not just for a employee relationship, but also a customer relationship. We, I, I feel all too often, and it, it's kind of a, it's a society thing, is we're very combative. Instead of like collaborating and coming together on exactly how can we make this work in the different perspectives is we become, uh, our automatic reaction is to become combative. Like you said, you shut down, you're, you're preparing your defense before the case has even been made. And I believe we should go into stuff looking at it as how do we collaborate and make this better? Like how do we make our end users or how do we make everybody in the construction industry, all your employees, our customers, how do we make it a better experience for them instead of how do I win right now when actually we're losing? Yes, and that gets into, you know, one of the, the key things that leaders do is they build relationships and trust. And um, that whole combative piece, that's, I, in my opinion, that is a symptom of a lack of trust. And that's why the topic of trust gets so important, because if we're always combative, then we're totally not listening, we're totally not collaborating, which, by the way, means we're not innovating either, and we're not constantly improving. Because those are not, you, you can't do that in a combative environment because you're in survival mode, right? And survival mode 
is just survival mode. That's not getting better. That's surviving. What's the phrase? We're surviving, not thriving. So the the whole idea about you know how do you build trust well first you have to make sure that that you share core values and principles that you ultimately want the same thing uh regardless of the words you're using right and once you can understand that that everyone in the room ultimately wants the same thing we want everyone to get home to their families safe and healthy we don't want to damage anybody when they come onto our job site. So if everybody agrees to that and they're all coming from there, well, that contextualizes a lot. Everybody needs to make enough of a profit to keep their business going and be sustainable, right? So that's where people are coming from. People want to come from a place of having integrity and being honest. And so, well, if that's true, then even if you're fighting with someone, you can say, listen, are we fighting for the truth here because we both want it? And then that means that you can start to make inroads. Now, we all know that not everybody cares about being honest or have any integrity. And if that's the problem, then you have to ask, do you, would, do you agree to be in business with that person the next day or agree to be on their team the next day or in that company the next day? But I, I really think that that gets back to why it's so important to have a shared mission, a shared core set of values a share set of principles because it makes that combative nature easier to overcome if you all ultimately want the same thing in the end then what are you fighting about the how to get there not the destination you're not fighting about the destination you might be fighting about are we going to turn left or right but we're ultimately all going to the same place yeah and i think we not losing sight of where we're headed, what that end goal is, whether it's a peer-to-peer -peer conversation, a leader to an employee or an employee to a leader or to a customer, making sure that you keep that vision of where you're headed in sight so you can work to your other and not have these combative situations yeah. because nothing's nothing's always easy nothing never just goes how it's supposed to go there's hard conversations that has to be had but having them bringing up these emotions understanding that these are emotions people have and then addressing them are so critical to how we communicate with each other on and off a job site yeah and you know construction hates talk about emotion because we, we just don't like it. But really paying attention to emotion, they're like symptoms that can help you diagnose what's broken in the process or the system. And you know, when somebody's frustrated, if, if your worldview is that everyone wants to do a good job, right? Everyone wants to succeed. The cup is half full. They're not out to get me. Like if that's your worldview and you're dealing with someone who is frustrated, then sitting back and saying, okay, well, why are they frustrated? What are they not getting? If I believe that they want to do the best they can do every single day and they're frustrated, that means that something is in their way. And me as a leader or as a manager, it's my duty to figure out what that thing is that is in their way and do everything I can to eliminate it from being in their way. And sometimes, you know, you have to, you know, suck it up, buttercup. We have to overcome it and get through it. But then that that responsibility changes into working with that person to show them, okay, I know we don't like this, but this is how, you know, we have to navigate it. Hmm. But frustration, yeah, we all get frustrated, but why? Why? It's it's a it's something that can tell you, point you in the right direction of changing things. And a lot of times we just discount the emotions but we can't because they're they're the the knee jerk reaction to what's really bothering us. Yeah, and I think that is a great question to leave our audience with here today is if you're frustrated, why? Take some time to think about that. Uh that that really is that's a good question because I think a lot of times we get frustrated and then we don't ever really think about it like it just passes. And we don't ever get to the why we got frustrated, which is where you can have growth and do all do all them amazing things. So, Laura, it has been absolutely fantastic having you here today. If all listeners wanted to reach out, where would they find you or how do they get a hold of you? 
Well, uh, I have a website that uh, reflects my my way of being. It's um, like, I don't care what you do, just do it with purpose and on purpose. So my website URL is withpurpose-onpurpose.com. And, um, and I also, I uh, create instructor kits for organizations because I can't train everything. I can't be everywhere at once. So I've started to create instructor kits for other um, expert trainers who, who want to do leadership courses in their organizations. And those are available at developingconstructionleaders.com. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us here today on Construction Champions. Thank you, Ron. It's been a, a great pleasure. Awesome. And uh, are you construction champions? I think we we dived into a lot of great things and topics today. And we really do have to look in the mirror as leaders and say, why am I frustrated? Or how do I communicate through this? What am I doing? Am I having one way or two way communications? And as a leader, ask ourselves, are we teaching our people to have one way communications that's going to set us up for failure down the road? Or are we training them and teaching them and showing them that we could we circle back, we could complete the communication gap. This is something that I think is really amazing. I think it's stuff that we should really all think about. And if we're going to move the industry forward like we are, because here at Construction Champions, that's what we're here to do. We're here to change the mindset, push the boundaries, and disrupt the entire industry and help you be the best you can be every day. So, Construction Champions, until next time.